Welcome to Integrative Oncology Talk, where we discuss the latest science and opinions from leading voices in integrative oncology. Integrative oncology utilizes complementary therapies and lifestyle strategies to help those affected by cancer using personalized approaches and evidence-based recommendations. This podcast is hosted by Dr. Santosh Rao, a medical oncologist and integrative oncologist, and Dr. Judith Lacey, a supportive care and integrative oncology physician. With support from the Society for Integrative Oncology, an international multidisciplinary organization whose mission is to advance the science and education of integrative oncology worldwide. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect views of the participants' workplace or SIO and are not meant to offer medical advice. The information, opinions, and recommendations in the podcast are for general information only. Before making any changes in your healthcare or lifestyle, please discuss with your healthcare provider. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Judith Lacey. I'm the co-host of Integrative Oncology Talks for the Society of Integrative Oncology. And today I'm very excited to have with me from the UK, um, Dr. Richard Berman. And Richard is the founder and director of Supportive Care UK and supportive and, pal- and a supportive and palliative care physician at the Christie NHS Foundation Trust in Manchester. He, he's doing really exciting stuff and um, we're going to get to that in a moment. He specialises in the prevention and management of adverse effects of cancer and cancer treatment, um, including care for those uh, reaching the last days of life, but all of those, also those people with uh, receiving curative treatment and um, managing their symptoms and uh, related to their cancer and their cancer treatment. He's also the NHS England's National Clinical Lead for Enhanced Supportive Care, and he'll tell us a little bit about what that means. And it's an initiative that's being rolled out across England to improve access for supportive care for patients going through cancer treatment at any stage. A few weeks ago, it wasn't many weeks ago, he hosted the first um, uh, Supportive Care and Cancer um, Conference, which was a virtual conference, um, which I had the pleasure of being involved in and speaking with about complementary therapies and chemotherapy-related toxicities and listening to some amazing speakers really looking at all the uh, important areas of supportive cancer care. It was an absolutely brilliant uh, meeting, but it was also the launch of the UK Association of Supportive Cancer Care. So uh, welcome, Richard. Thanks very much, Judith, for asking me to do this. No, and thank you for saying yes. So um, I'm going to ask you a question um, really just to start us off and we, um, and and it's why are you personally so passionate about supportive care and oncology care? What got you here? And um, maybe include a little bit of how you got there and what motivates you to do this work. Yeah, sure. Uh, so... Um, well, I started off uh, life as a, as a palliative care uh, consultant after I did GP training first. Um, and uh, I was and still am passionate about uh, palliative care and end of life care. Um, I actually got into it because uh, after my GP training, I went to a lecture in a hospice. And uh, the consultant there in the hospice, who is a guy called Charles Daniels, was so impressive uh, that I decided to change tack and go from general practice into palliative medicine I was actually so impressed with him that I named my first born son after him Charles <laughs> uh, so so he he uh, he got me into palliative medicine um, and that was initially in London and then I, I moved uh, with my family to Manchester um, and got a job in a, in a in a hospice for a while and then and then did palliative care training um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm passionate about palliative care, um, and uh, uh, I, I ended up getting a job at the Christie, which is which is uh, um, a major cancer centre in the UK. It serves the northwest of England, um, a large part of it, about 3.2 million people. Um, and I joined the team as a palliative care consultant. At the time, uh, the team was sort of very focused on on palliative care, end of life care, incurable disease, patients in the last few weeks and months of life. 
Um, and I suppose what happened uh, as the years went on, which I'm sure is the same for everyone, is things around us started to change. So um, cancer treatments started to improve, probably gathered pace more in the last few years. Uh, so we started as a palliative care team to get more and more referrals for patients who weren't, I suppose, traditionally palliative. So, so those who were um, much, much earlier in their in their cancer journey, perhaps you know, close to diagnosis of incurable disease, but also referrals for patients who were on curative uh, treatment pathways. Um, who had pain and symptom problems, holistic needs that the oncologist felt, well, you guys can probably help with this. There's no one else to help with this. And then we started to get referrals for patients who had survived cancer, who had problems as a result of having had cancer and, and cancer treatments. Uh, and um, I suppose the kind of thing that changed me was I was invited to go to MASK, in 2014. Uh, MASC, as everyone knows, Multinational Association of Supportive Care and Cancer. It was a conference in, in Miami. And I thought, yeah, I quite fancy a trip to Miami. Um, and I went with a, a group of people, including Andrew Davis, who's the current president of MASC. And I was, I was really impressed by the Miami, but also by the conference. Uh, the the, the uh, broad range of, of topics, and the fact that the people that were there were such a great mix of people who supported cancer patients. There was oncologists, palliative care, endocrinologists, pain specialists, psycho-oncologists, etc. And I, I just thought this is really exciting. So um, this is kind of uh, how I got interested in, in supportive care. And uh, I suppose I, I am where I am now because... I just carried on developing that, that interest over the years um, and it led to sort of various interesting things that perhaps we're going to touch on uh, uh, during the course of this uh, interview. That's fantastic. I was there. You probably didn't meet me. I've been <laughs> and I think oh, you were there. I was there. I was there. I've been in yeah, Miami, Berlin. I've been around at Mask and Mask is probably the thing that also uh, hooked me into supportive care as well because I think we realised as we keep people living longer with cancer, we actually have a responsibility to keep them living well and we had the skills and being initially, originally palliative care trained after um, realising um, uh, how what those skills are to actually really listen and with to the person and be present for the person that actually it makes sense to move that to any stage of disease and really get an understanding of working with cancer patients and their experience. And there was something that you said in the launch of the UK Association of Supportive Care, which was, you know, and um, uh, you and also Andrew Davies spoke about it, which was very much about um, the changing, um, the shift of the patients that we're seeing now uh, with cancer, people are living longer with cancer, people are living with advanced cancer on treatment, the toxicities of treatment are changing um, and it's really our responsibility, I see it, and I guess this is why I've got an interest in integrative medicine as well as, as part of this supportive care, is how do we... Uh, reduce the traditional use of polypharmacy, but also, uh, which we often, which is, which was the the, the go to when people were dying with cancer and palliative care, uh, physicians felt comfortable in prescribing a lot of drugs. Um, but how do we manage those symptoms, and how do we help people thrive with cancer? And I'm. It's a bit of a segue to ask you about the enhanced supportive care program that you've developed at the Christie and what that actually means and where you see um, integrating exercise, lifestyle change, other ways to approach symptom management in the um, supportive care space. Yeah, uh, so the enhanced supportive care initiative um, was started actually, you know, when I got back from the conference in Miami I thought well we need to do something here and, and uh, Andrew and I had a sort of good chat about things um so, so what 
I, I did probably the most important thing that I've ever done in my career, which is I, I arranged a kind of consultation between my team and, and several of the oncologists and also between my team and patients. We arranged patient focus groups and we said to them, look, we can see as a palliative care team that the world around us is changing. Just like you've said, Judith, people living much longer, uh, more cancer survivors, uh, more patients on curative intent treatment pathways. So where do you see us fitting in as a palliative care team into your world of oncology? And they were very clear, really. Um, and there was a lot of overlap between what the two groups said. Um, they said, we want you to be involved across the whole continuum. You know, we want you to use your skills across the whole continuum. Why not? There's no one else really to, to, yeah. to do this. And uh, uh, the other thing they said was, but you need to change your name. Yeah. And uh, of course, they talked about the barriers of referral to a palliative care team, particularly referring earlier to a palliative care team. And uh, particularly for also for patients who are curative or survivors, referring to a palliative care team, it doesn't quite make sense. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we rebranded and we said, right, we're going to start being much more involved initially in incurable cancer patients at a much earlier point. And we said to them, we want you to start referring within six weeks of diagnosis of incurable disease for patients who are starting to develop problems. And we piloted this in four disease groups. Um, and uh, the idea was to, to get involved at an earlier point, to try and prevent escalation of problems, which eventually lead to patient potentially being admitted. And of course, up until that point, we'd been much more of a kind of reactive service. So the patients were already admitted uh, and in crisis. And, and our focus previously was not so much on the outpatient, outpatient population, and we wanted to shift that. So we did that, and very quickly we saw results. Okay, so we saw that uh, we were having a significant effect on unplanned admission reduction, and uh, that was translating to uh, benefits to the health economy as well as quality of care. So the, 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 hot, the pilot at Christie was picked up by NHS England, and they said, hey, let's try this in other cancer centres around England. Uh, so the rest is kind of history in that there are now <clears throat> over 20 cancer centres in England who provide enhanced supportive care, doing the same thing, picking up patients early and helping to de-escalate problems before they go into crisis. Uh, so um, it, it's, it's a successful, it's a successful program, I'm, I'm pleased to say. Um, the, the, the way we sell enhanced supportive care is it's the first step for cancer centres to start to implement supportive care in cancer in their centres. And once you've kind of nailed the getting involved early with incurable disease, you can then um, expand and start looking at other cohorts such as survivors and patients with curative intent treatment. So it's really interesting. It's going really well. If nothing else, <clears throat> it's really got the discussion going in the UK about supportive care in cancer. And so a lot of our centres are um, calling, there are increasing centres calling themselves supportive care and integrative medicine, integrative oncology, uh, in ha uh, comprehensive supportive care. Where do you see the role of, where does, where do the complementary therapies, the integrative approach, the lifestyle medicine, mind-body therapies, other non-pharmacological management of symptoms fit into these enhanced supportive care model um, centres and models? Or does so it? I see the or does it? <laughs> It, it certainly does, though um, I see enhanced supportive care as an initiative. So, so enhanced supportive care is about implementing supportive care in cancer centres. Mm. I see enhanced supportive care is kind of the, the first step to that stage, sort mm. of accepting that things have changed, that we need to think about the terms, that we need to get involved in other parts of the pathway. What we've moved on to now is... Um, what we're calling supportive oncology. So here at Christie, 
we've done the enhanced supportive care thing, we've changed the culture in the organisation, and we're now saying, right, we're going to be um, expanding this whole thing, and we want to look at supportive oncology as a thing, which yeah. is um, implementing supportive care principles across the whole continuum. Now, integrative oncology, uh, as well as multiple other um, uh, specialist areas all fits into under that umbrella of supportive oncology um, and what we're saying is that as supportive oncologists we're interested in providing care across the whole spectrum of cancer and multiple non-oncology specialties in the organization all fit under that umbrella of supportive oncology including integrative oncology so it's interesting, isn't it, this play around of how we best support our patients. So we, um, I'm uh, trying to write a paper. We haven't quite uh, got there to finish it with the guys from survivorship of how integrative oncology, supportive care and survivorship all, all marry. Um, and it, and it's, the, it's this um, potentially artificial divide of, um, siloed palliative care services, um, these enhanced supportive care services. You've got the British Society of Integrative Oncology, but integrative uh, oncology, which is really thriving in um, the US, uh, in our service, where you're integrating exercise, lifestyles change, safe use of complementary evidence-based therapies, um, dietary changes and natural therapies to help empower people to actually um, improve their own health, well-being, survivorship, um, and and thrive. How you know is integrative oncology is supportive oncology the answer? Is this the term that we're looking for? Is this the way of moving forward of of really looking at the whole person and looking at different ways to get everybody's skills and working together to best support. Um, our patients? I think it is. I like the term because it's got the word oncology in it and anything with the word oncology in it, you know, automatically gets some street cred. Um, it, it's already won hearts and minds with the oncologists here and the managers and the trust board here. Um, they've finally, after sort of, you know, I've been here 20, 20 years or so, kind of accepted, acknowledged that this is important. And, you know, previously um, the focus was all about cancer treatments and, you know, chemotherapy, surgery. But now there's a there's a acknowledgement that that we can't just be focused on that. You know, we in the in in um, England at the moment there are two million people living with cancer. By 2030 there'll be more than three million people living with cancer. Who's going to provide the services, the clinical services, the resource to look after these patients when they have problems? You know, um, we have to do this now because otherwise it's, it, you know, we're going to wake up one day and think, oh, my gosh, there's three, three, four million people living with cancer. They've got all these problems. Who, who's going to look after them? What you said before about silos is important and we do all work in silos we, we work in silos here the non-oncology teams you know there's been kind of uh, uh you know we've been with a bit of nice thing over the years whereas whereas now we need to be seen as a as an essential thing and part of that the other reason i like uh, supportive oncology is that it gives us this framework under which we can all work help to improve integrate the clinical services that we all provide um, and also uh, start getting the research because we don't really fully know what we're doing you know <laughs> we, we, well we don't you know we as a palliative care physician I know how to manage somebody's pain in yeah. the last weeks months of life but I don't know really how to manage somebody's pain when they're living for many many years with treatable but incurable cancer and the same goes for those on curative treatment. The same goes for those who are survivor, have survivorship issues. We, we don't have the research. We don't know how to do it. So uh, we, we've got to start working on this now. And I think people get that. 
in the UK and, and further afield. Um, I think people get there's a need now. Um, so yeah, winning it's winning hearts and minds here. This. And I think that that comment of you know we don't really know how to um, you know treat pain if they're not dying because I think with cancer pain when people are have advanced disease and you know having trained in palliative care twenty something years ago now and worked in that space people were dying of metastatic breast cancer and now they're not dying as quickly. And so if you put someone on opioids or with benzodiazepines, you weren't worried about the long-term consequences. And now we're looking at, well, what can we do? Uh, we have an opioid problem. Uh, we, um, we're really looking at um, treating some of these patients as people with chronic illness. And so we need to look back at the chronic pain and other um uh, chronic pain approach, and I think the work of um, SI, the Society of Integrative Oncology and ASCO and the pain guidelines that will be coming out that have been a team led by Eduardo Barrera and Jordan Mao um, looking at the, the level of evidence for an integrative approach to pain management will inform um, what we know and why what research we still need to do. And I think... Um, that's a bit of a segue to my next question, which is do we need, you, you've, you've t spoken a little bit, well, you've, you've written a bit on Twitter, you've spoken a little bit about, you know, if this is a new specialty, do we need to have a new training program? And um, do you want to talk a little bit about what, uh, what you're thinking about there? Yeah, sure. So, again, it goes back to the, the, the changing landscape here. So, yeah. so there's now... There's now more than ever um, a need for input from multiple speci specialties uh, into into council care across the whole spectrum, and um, there's there's almost a kind of new set of skills needed now. You know, back when I was born in I'm 50 this year, so so 1972. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Julian. Uh, the you know. The, if you got diagnosed with cancer in 1972, uh, the chances of you taking all, all cancers taken into consideration being alive in 1982 were about 20%. Now, if you get diagnosed with cancer, all cancers taken into consideration on average, the chances of you being alive in 2032 are much better, 60% oh. around that kind of mark, oh. and it's getting better all of the time. Um, so, so, um, so, so things are you know, changing significantly. And back in 1972, when, when the prognosis was poor, you needed oncology, you needed palliative medicine. And palliative medicine was born as a specialty in, in the 1980s because right. the, there was a need and there still is a need. People are always going to need excellent end of life care. But now with these new cohorts who have new problems and new treatments coming out all the time with, with new, uh, new problems, we're, we're in a new era. Yeah. So... Um, we're increasingly using um, in, uh, expertise from our endocrinology colleagues, um, from our psycho-oncology colleagues, from our integrative oncology colleagues here, complementary therapy team, etc., physiotherapy, occupational therapy, um, you name it, dermatology, cardiology, respiratory medicine, neurology. Um, so, so is there now a need for a specialty of supportive oncology where supportive oncology clinicians have a kind of broad expertise in all of these areas, um, work across the whole spectrum of the disease um, and sort of provide input on sort of day to day uh, problems in the cancer centre and beyond. And that they would then refer on to colleagues in the say endocrine uh, specialty area if they needed sort of more more uh, complex intervention and advice so I believe there is a need and uh, certainly uh, talking to oncology colleagues here they agree I think it should be a branch of oncology and I'd like to see development of therapeutic oncology with with medical oncology and clinical oncology working together diagnostic oncology and supportive oncology uh, I think that would be a great direction of travel make cancer care future proof 
And so what are you doing about that? I, I agree. I think that's wonderful. And we're just, um, you know, we're very fortunate. Um, I'm in a, a large comprehensive cancer centre, big research centre. I have a fantastic team. Um, and we've just realised that we've got so many uh, specialists that are needed to manage our patients as well. You know, we've got the pain specialists, we've got the geriatricians, and we're always referring to those endocrinologists and the rheumatologists. Do they need to actually come on board and be part of this supportive care space? Are we, do we have the adequate skills to do the basic management? Should it be, or should it be the medical oncologist that upskill in um, rheumatology or should it really be that every patient needs a, from the time of diagnosis, ideally needs to um, have a supportive care um, component to their care with their therapeutic and their diagnostic oncology that every person uh, that comes into your hospital from diagnosis who has supportive care needs is has their needs identified and that you actually proactively manage them. Is that is that what you're talking about when you're talking about this pillar? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, you know, one of the counter arguments to that is, well, you know, um, that's going to take a lot of resource and a lot of money if we suddenly get all of these referrals. Mm. But, but I would argue that a lot of the raw materials for allowing that to happen are already there. But it's just it's just the way we're working in silos is so inefficient um, that we can do a lot more with what we've got to to allow things like that to to happen. You know, it, it, here at, at Christie, um, we they've just um, rearranged the kind of divisional structure. And we now have for the first time an acute and supportive uh, cancer care directorate, which is a real sort of flag in the sand moment. Um, and what they've said is, you know, get get yourselves organised. Let's see, let's see what you're made of, uh, uh, which is great. Uh, the other thing we're doing here, in, in answer to your question, what are you doing about it? The supportive oncology thing uh, becoming a specialty is we're, we're we're putting together a diploma in supportive oncology, um, and uh, I think that's probably an important step in. Uh, um, you know, saying to everybody, look, this is a thing and this is important. And, you know, there's already a lot of interest in that. So the, the training directors for medical oncology and clinical oncology here in Manchester have said, you know what, we, we need our trainees to be doing this diploma when it, when it, when it gets put together. So, so I think a diploma is important in terms of first steps. How do you create a new specialty? Um, I suppose we're finding out as we, as we go along. Uh, a and E did it. Palliative medicine did it. Um, it's about the need, isn't it? The need is there, and we've got to demonstrate that very clearly. And I think uh, for many of us, we we call ourselves. We've said we're calling ourselves supportive care. And um, Andrew Davies said it very nicely at your at the UK um, supportive care conference the other week that. Um, palliative care is not supportive care. Supportive care is supportive care. Now, what the hell is that? We've got the mask definition. Um, where does survivorship fit in? Is that separate? Is it a part of supportive care? Um, and how do you go about that? That the and you know, at your conference, you had stuff on the microbiome and lifestyle medicine on survivorship care. I mean, how does it all? How are you fitting that component in the, you know, is survivorship the same as, you know, if you look at the ASCO definition, is survivorship and supporting care the same thing, supporting people proactively from diagnosis and have different phases? Or is, are we calling the same thing by different names in different countries? How, where does it fit for you guys? So just to say on the, the, the microbiome talk, that was Hannah Wardle and it, it was yeah. absolutely fascinating. Got such good feedback from that, and it what that talk, uh, the gut microbiome talk, uh, highlighted was the um, the the huge breadth of of supportive care, and you know you you, you, you we're just scratching the surface at the moment, and yeah. the work that Hannah's, Hannah Hannah and her team are doing is is so interesting and, and hugely significant. Um, where does survivorship fit in for us? It's under the umbrella of supportive oncology. 
Um, and I think probably the same for mask as well. You know, it fits under that mask umbrella, that mask definition, and it certainly does for us too. I mean, you know, interestingly in the UK, there's a lot of talk about survivorship. There's lots of uh, um, papers written about it, but in terms of clinical services, there's very little out there. It's very, very uh, patchy. And uh, uh, again, this goes back to if we can get organized as a, as a group of non-oncology specialties, then we should be we should be able to offer services for, for patients who are survivors. Again, you know, how do we manage people who've got survivorship problems? The evidence isn't really there and we need to we need to get it. And I, I do, uh, my team do see survivors in the, in, our, in our clinics. We have daily sportive oncology clinics, and uh, we we work very closely with with other colleagues, with pain colleagues, with our endocrine colleagues, uh, to try and uh, help help manage patients in the best way we can. Uh, but certainly, you know, you alluded to it before, the chronic pain model probably fits better with with survivorship. But then is it right that our survivorship patients are sent to local pain services where then, you know, they're in the same boat, really. They're not used to managing cancer survivorship issues. Um, so, again, I think there's a bit of a crisis at the moment and that crisis is getting worse and worse because we're not doing enough now to put these services together for patients, you know, particularly survivors. Where do they go? Where are they supposed to go when they've got when they've got problems? And what we're saying is, well, they should be coming to us. Um, we need this kind of supportive oncology uh, system uh, structure uh, that we then can refer out. We can triage, refer out as necessary uh, to to other specialties. So, so I think it's really, really important. So here we have a system that is the has the capacity to really care for people across the whole continuum of cancer and from diagnosis all the way through, a system that has the potential to integrate um, evidence-informed and evidence-based approaches to lifestyle change, exercise oncology then fits in nicely, acupuncture for mm -hmm. peripheral neuropathy potentially, your super-duper low-level laser device that we've actually got in the room next door uh, for mucositis, no. and I'm going, oh, I want to do a study on that one. Um, and uh, so we're, we're starting to see that actually there is capacity to start integrating these services, um, maybe not all by the same name, into our cancer centres, which leads to the question of funding. And um, I think the in Australia anyway and probably in the US, maybe in the UK, I've got, I'm going to ask this question, funding models are often a little, maybe a decade or two behind sometimes for uh, cancer services. So we finally got some funding for palliative care, um, but there's no funding for supportive care. And there's definitely no funding for wellness programs or exercise programs, except for maybe a few, uh, if, you, if you're lucky and you um, um, do it in a certain way. So how, how are you funding this? And is, is the NHS like a step ahead or are you just, you know, have, have you got a secret formula? <laughs> so uh, it was interesting when we go back to enhanced supportive care because um, the, the big thing there was with, with the, the teams involved, you know, hang on. Uh, we can't we can't possibly take on more patients. We can't possibly see patients much earlier on. We're only a small team. We've got enough patients who are end of life. That has to be our focus. Uh, so there's sort of immediate alarm. Um, at the same time that alarm was going on, uh, the the we were making the case for enhanced supportive care, and. Uh, you know, what was clear earlier on was there was a need there and the oncologists who were a powerful lobby were very supportive of it. I, you know, they liked the principles of it. They got it. They understood it. And they liked the kind of name, the, the rebrand. So it won hearts and minds. I keep saying that, but it won hearts and minds really quickly. And, and I suppose, um, you know, now we moved on to these sort of broader supportive oncology work. 
you know, it's doing the same thing. We, so, so what's the, what's the formula, you know, making the case, you know, speaking confidently, making the case, getting key people on board to, to support you. Um, you know, they're, they're sort of, uh, prominent oncologists, the, the trust board, um, the sort of wider important people in health and then collecting the data. So it's, it's all about the data. You know, nobody, nobody's, just interested in a nice idea you've got you've got to have the data there to to support your case um and it and uh, and then if your outcomes demonstrate that the 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 case uh, is is worthwhile then you know you're onto it onto a winner and i'm not saying it's easy um but you know there's there's something there's some freshness in this and i think people like a bit of a fresh a fresh approach. People are looking for, you know, how can we do things better? How can we make outcomes better for patients? How can we improve cost efficiencies? You know, what what can we do? You know, particularly in today's society, with with the world as it is, with the increasing financial constraints on everybody, they're looking for ways of doing things better. And I I do think there's a lot in supportive oncology and and all that's underneath it um, that, that is fresh, and um, there's increasing evidence around the world to show the, the benefits of it. And uh, therefore, making the case is actually easy. Uh, so everybody, just push. Keep pushing. It's slow pro- progress, but keep pushing. This is definitely the right thing to do. And, you know, onwards and upwards with, with all of it, because it, it, it will come. You know, I'm sure that when palliative medicine was first launched you know that took years and years and years to work and, and lobbying um similarly a and e interventional cardiology etc etc so so um it's just dedication persistence showing the data making the case and i think and i think you know i mean i'm i'm uh, totally um I'm on my soapbox a lot of the time talking about supportive care using the term supportive oncology Talking about integrative oncology as a as a component of supportive oncology, and that um, and I love the umbrella, even though I think it's from some weird game, um, the <laughs> some yeah. umbrella diagram yeah. um, of having uh, that you talked about of having integrative oncology as one part of supportive oncology, as is the the psychosocial support, as is palliative care survivorship programs and that for many of us who are very comfortable moving from space to space so I'll be looking after my advanced cancer patients on the ward but then also be doing a survivorship clinic later on in the day or seeing people um, about and talking gut health and the microbiome for half a half a session I think it's really important that we do have um, that upskilling in those skills and if we've got this enlarged, this growing toolbox of offerings, um, is it feasible that we all um, understand everything within that toolbox or do you think it's that we just need to work out how to refer to the right people in the team and then as maybe the doctor or the nurse practitioner then coordinate their care? So in practice... What does it look like as a so, uh, senior patient? Okay. I, th- I think there's a need at the moment with this so being so early. I mean, this is my thoughts anyway. Yeah. To to kind of sort of take ownership of the whole thing, and that that's partly because there's there's a need to kind of bring it all together, um, and there's a need for someone or some team to say, look, we're going to try and bring all of this together under, under supportive oncology. Um, but that, of course, doesn't mean that you do it all, because the whole point of this is to improve that kind of working between all of the different teams and use all the different teams effectively. Um, so, so you know, often if I see, for example, a survivorship patient, that will require referrals to integrative oncology to psycho-oncology to uh, you know our pain services but there's there's a need to kind of someone to sort of be there as the kind of generalist to kind of uh, put, put all of this together the other thing is 
you know, the strength in numbers and um, putting all of this together under one umbrella at the moment, I think is important. Uh, and I suppose a specialty will start as a kind of big general thing and then may kind of subspecialize uh, even further, um, which I suppose effectively maybe what, what's happening in terms of with palliative medicine that, that actually some people are saying now, well, you know, these other bits actually don't quite fit into palliative medicine and we need something else, something, something different here. Mm. Yeah. And I think, you know, I was having a discussion today. I've got a new doctor that's um, just starting with this and we were talking about that importance of, um, so of, of having that generalist approach, but more than a generalist approach, it's somebody who looks after um, the whole person, and I think Andrew said, you know, there's the oncologist maybe really need to look after the cancer, but it's about supportive care yeah. look after the whole person and that the doctor's role, and I call my consultation a holistic supportive care consultation because I was thinking, what do you call it? I'm looking after the whole person and it's really supportive care, but I'm using tools from integrative oncology within my delivery is is holistic a good word? But I think we're all talking about something similar, being able to help put it together for that person, to empower that person to move forward and to and to live well, thrive, get the best treatment possible, keep out of the hospital system and um, reduce their days off work, uh, improve their ability to maintain connection with their family, Uh, get them exercising, get them eating the right food and um, minimising the toxicities um, of the cancer um, therapies through really proactive management. Um, So are we all, I think we're talking the same language, aren't we? We're talking about the same thing. Absolutely. We we definitely are talking about the same thing, yeah. And, And then we're talking about, well, do we need to train specialists in integrative oncology or do we need to train people in supportive care or do we train them um or does is palliative care training potentially good enough um i'm hearing no you need to really understand this nuanced piece and this nuanced new field of cancer care I think so. I mean, we're, we're always going to need people who are kind of super specialised in, in palliative medicine, in integrative oncology, in endocrinology, etc. But I suppose what I'm seeing in a need for here is that kind of generalist uh, supportive oncology specialist who, who, who can sort of provide advice on, on, and support and treatment on, on a range of problems across all of these areas, including acute oncology, which we've you know, not talked about, uh, but then you know can can refer on uh, as needed to all of these different specialties. And uh, yes, it, it's sort of um, a big step, but but it is needed. I think it's um, and no, go on, Judith. No, I no, I was just agreeing. I think it is a big step, but I think it's just that natural step. I don't think there's anywhere else to go. This is what can you know. I gave it. I was chatting, uh, giving a just a journal club the other day. I was actually giving a summary of the UK um, conference to our journal club, to our medical and radiation oncologists. And my comment was, you know, you guys have made profoundly changed um, the the survivorship and the um, the trajectory of disease for so many people, and it's continuing to improve. I mean, you look at people living now with stage four melanoma, people with Lung cancer are responding to immunotherapy. This is a whole new population of patients. And um, I think the health systems actually have to start investing in supportive oncology. I don't, there's no, there's no alternative. I think, um, and I don't know, I really don't know what more we have to do to prove, <laughs> to prove it's important. And so I think, I think we're doing. I think we're doing okay. I mean, you know, these things have to start somewhere and we're all in our different countries sort of building things up in in our own way. But, you know, what's come out of this conversation between you and I is actually there's so many parallels in, in terms of how you guys are thinking and how we're thinking. Yeah, and, and of course, that is just a reflection of the fact that it's a need. 
And I think, and I think that probably, um, you know, I think we can talk for quite a while on this, but I think the, um, I think it's an exciting sp space to work. You know, I was thinking, oh, when am I going to retire? Am I getting, um, is there more to do? And I think that um, discovering this space of uh, supportive oncology, which I love that term, um, integrative oncology, you know, expanding our toolbox, oh, the microbiome, it's so interesting, um, what you can do with a laser machine. And I think that what we're all learning in our own countries and from each other is that um, if you care, if you really care about what goes on for the person and you understand what tools you have available for, for you, for um, to offer them and to um, bring into the system, I think we can do this. I think we're learning that this is good medicine and this is going to change the face of um, of cancer cancer care and maybe that concept that we, if we're turning it into a chronic illness, we may need to start looking at chronic illness models and what's required. So um, one of the people who's uh, involved in the uh, progress of it, uh, it, it, what you're saying there is, will it spill over outside of cancer? Mm. And, and I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will mm. uh, because it's needed. it's needed there too. And uh, I suppose that's exciting in itself. Uh, but um, we, we've got we've got more work to do in cancer in cancer yet. Although there are, there are pockets of people in the UK doing this kind of thing in non-cancer. So thank you, Richard. What a what an interesting conversation. I think um, it, it's keeping me uh, motivated, and hopefully, it's this discussion has motivated a few of our listeners to um, think about. Um, supportive oncology and that interface between supportive care and integrative oncology and what you can do in your comprehensive cancer centre and um, and how we all work together to, to move this field forward. So Thanks, Judith. Thank you. Thank you.